I make no apologies there for the extended intro. They're very rare here on the GP Llama YouTube channel and I really wanted to capture what the last four months of riding this bike was all about. Now as you've seen, I've spent many, many hours riding this bike as there's no lack of quality gravel here in country Victoria. And today it's time to give you my take on how the bike's going. In a previous video, I've covered all the components and the preparation for this build. And then all those parts were delivered to Nick from the Drop Cycling YouTube channel who's produced a brilliant build video on this bike. I'll link below if you want to check this out. Now before I begin diving into the details of this review, a quick recap of the components used for the build as this is a custom build, it's not an off the shelf bike. The frame and fork, well it's a Cervelo Espero 54cm in grey sea breeze. It has the SRAM Red ETAP Axis hydraulic levers and calipers. The rear derailleur, Eagle XX1 Axis. The cassette, all the way up the tree, to the XG1299 Eagle Axis Rainbow, which is a 1052 with a matched Eagle chain. The crankset, SRAM Red 1 crankset, with the Axis Power Meter Spider, which is effectively a quark. The chainring on that is a 42 tooth, bottom bracket SRAM dub. I do switch pedals a little bit on this bike, so you'll see either the Favero Asioma Duos with the SPD conversion on this bike, or the Expedo M Force 8 Titanium Edition. I'm running Zip Service Course SL70 XPLR handlebars, 42 centimeters wide, Zip bar tape, Service Course stem and post. The Service Course post was in the original build. I've swapped that out and I'll talk more about that in a moment. The saddle again has been swapped. It was the Pro Stealth that I went with early on. The wheel set, Zip 303 Firecrest, the 2021 model, which are hookless, 25 mil internal. And the tires are the Zip Tangente Course G40 tubeless, which have been since rebranded as just the G40 XPLRs. As to be expected with those components, the full build came out very light, weighing in at 7.95 kilos on Nick's scales just after the build. And I've done some upgrades, those being the Pro Stealth switched out for the Prologo Dimension NAC rail saddle. So that's gone from 215 grams on the saddle down to 154. And the seat post, I was running the Zip 20mm setback seat post. I've switched that over to the stock standard Cervelo Espero seat post, which is a straight seat post. And that's a little lighter. That's come in from 248 grams down to 183 grams. So on paper, this bike weighs in at 7.824 kilos. Now, of course, there's pedals, there's cages, there's computer mounts, there's saddlebags and everything to make it heavier. But the baseline bike is very, very light. Now what I'm going to do with this video is split it off into sections or chapters as they call it on YouTube. So you can jump between sections if you want with a little timeline bar down the bottom. Now what I'll cover is the frame and ride, the group set and gearing, the wheels and tires, the saddle, the bars, the maintenance, some comparisons, and I finally answer at the end, are gravel bikes really a thing? Okay, kicking things off with the frame and the ride experience as it relates to the geometry of the Aspero. Now I'm running a 54 centimeter frame and that has been perfect for my bike fit, so I've been happy with that. The handling is as expected and as sold. This bike is no beach cruiser. Cervelo make the claim of hauling yourself, not cargo, and that's absolutely how the bike responds. In a straight line, power to the pedals, the thing is not slow. One thing worth noting with gravel bikes in general, and in particular this bike, is that when you tip it in on a corner and the bike is leant over, it does feel a little heavy bringing it into the turn and then bringing it back out. It's to be expected, I guess, for a gravel bike. They are a different geometry to a road bike, but it's something to be aware of if you're comparing the ride feel of a twitchy road bike, for me that's coming from two giant TCRs, to a bike like this. It takes a little bit more to push it over and a little bit more to bring it back. Not a bad thing though on gravel. The last thing you want to do is turn it too fast and wash out that front tire. There are two fork rake settings with this, so you can change that a little bit, but it's not something that I've dived into just yet. Staying true to their not cargo part of the tagline, there are no bag or pannier bosses with the Aspero, which is similar to the Canyon Grail. For me, not a problem. I didn't buy this bike to go gravel adventure packing or anything like that. Uh, Strap-on bags would work fine if that requirement ever does pop up. The small Cervelo top tube frame bag, I tried that once, but it's not for me. Most of my rides are between one and two hours on this bike, and I'm riding it pretty aggressively, so I'm out of the saddle quite a lot. Throwing this bike side to side, where that saddlebag sits, it's always hitting my knees. Five years ago, I would have been laughing at current me, but I'm now using the front mount bag. That works very, very well for holding snacks, extra batteries, pump, and more snacks. And the final thing I'll note on this bike, and I'm not sure this is a metric I've ever seen on a bike review, is that when your hands are off the bars and you're riding in a straight line, the bike is very, very well balanced. It rides as straight as an arrow. A few of my road bikes tend to go one way or the other. When your hands are on the bars, that's not a problem, but just something of note, this bike does go in a dead straight line when your hands are off the bars. 
So the wrap up of the frame and the bike handling, I'm actually very, very happy with it. The group set and the gearing. Now I chose to make the leap onto the other side of the electric fence going with SRAM Axis as opposed to Shimano DI2, which I do dearly love. Now with this, it's the Axis mullet setup. So it's a one by chainring on the front, 42 tooth. On the gravel wheels, I have a 1052 cassette and on the road wheels that I have is a 1050. I'd love to have a smaller cassette on the back there for the road, but given I'm running an Eagle chain, Eagle rear derailleur, it needs to be matched with an Eagle cassette. And the smallest one of that is the 1050 for the road. The simplicity of the one by group set is welcome for me off road. It's as simple as up and down and no other thinking required. I'm not double guessing what chain ring I'm in on the front and if I change that, do I need to compensate on the back? It's just this or this, doesn't get any easier. It is worth noting that the SRAM Red Hydro Levers are quite large in the hand coming from DI2. Now this is something they have addressed on the rival axis. This also has a slightly different internal setup too. So just be aware of that if you're moving from DI2 over to something like SRAM Red, Grab a hold of those levers and see if they fit your hand. The Quark Spider Power Meter hasn't missed a beat. It just simply works. It also has the Magic Zero, which means there's no need to auto zero manually prior to each ride. The Eagle XX1 rear derailleur took a stick to the face on one of my rides. Well, almost a whole tree actually. Now I pulled it out and rode on. That thing is super strong, as you'd expect being a mountain bike rear derailleur. The Axis battery, I've only had to swap twice uh, in the last four months, so that's not too bad. The charge time is under 60 minutes, and I carry the spare in the front bag. They're pretty light, so no problems at all there with recharge time and battery life on the rear derailleur. The head unit and GPS connectivity for the SRAM Axis is a tick. There's no need to buy an additional module for this group set. Uh, you'll get gearing data and battery warnings on your GPS unit when you've got that paired up. You'll also get access to the SRAM Axis web stats, which gives you a breakdown of all of your rides. And most importantly, scrolling down here to the component summary which is pretty cool. So you can see there the front rings I was using on this ride here in Bright. So the 42 tooth, well, it's the only front chain ring I had for an hour 17. But up the back there, you can see I'm using the 52 for eight minutes, the 42 for seven minutes. And the most used gear there is the 21 tooth for 15 minutes, but you can click across power in gear. And the 52 was definitely getting a workout there. Gear ratio information. And if I had some tire whizzes on there, I'd also get some tire pressure data. Also note right there at the top, 221 rear shifts and 9.34 shifts per kilometer. Some interesting statistics. As you saw there on the SRAM Axis website, the gearing information is quite detailed. So let's have a chat about the gearing that I've chosen for this bike. Now, a lot of people said I'd never use the 52 up the back. It's a complete waste of time. Well, actually I do use it. And those stats say that I use it quite a bit. So what kind of gradient requires a 52 with a 42 on the front? Well, this one right here, which isn't too far from home, which leads to a brilliant little sunset lookout. You can see me here crawling up very, very slowly, but it's within the capabilities of this bike. I'm not grinding too hard. I was able to keep the bike pointed in a straight line without having to deliver the mail side to side, and I got to the top. I think that tops out at about 22%. And as you can see, definitely worth the ride for the views. Now down to the other end of the cassette, onto the 10 cog. Would the 4210 be too easy? Would I be spinning out if I was to ride this bike with a set of road wheels or on a fast descent with the gravel tires? And this is the website that I did my homework on, so I was pretty confident I'd be good with the 4210 on the back. So I've punched in the details here of the road setup that I have for the Aspero. That is the 700C wheels, 28 mil tire size, 42 on the front, and the cogs are from the 1050 that I have on the back of that. And the table that it spits out Super cool. So if I was to ride along at say 100 RPM in the 4210, I'll be doing just under 54 kilometers per hour. Not bad for a gravel bike. And the extreme case, if I was doing say 135 RPM, I'd be doing 72 and a half kilometers per hour. That's more than enough. Now putting those numbers from bikecalc.com to the test, here's me out on the road in the 4210, spinning out at around 135 RPM and hovering around that 72 to 74 kilometer an hour mark. Confirming that the 4210 is more than enough for what I need on this bike. So I've been happy with the range of gears on the bike with the 42 on the front and the 1050 or the 1052 on the back. It is worth noting though that with the one by setup, there's never gonna be a sweet spot for some of the climbs that you'll be on. You'll either be spinning or grinding. So there is a bit of a trade off with the simplicity of one by. Sometimes you're just not gonna be in the right gear. And finally, on the gearing and group set, the multi-clicks that I installed, I've done a video on those, um, makes life easy. I do like satellite shifters. I'm a little lazy like that too. Onto the wheels and tires, and there's not much to report here, which is a good thing. 
Uh, they're light, they spin well, no issues at all with the Zip 303 Firecrests. I don't have as many hours on the Scribe Road Wheels that I've put on the other week, but they're also rolling quite well with the GP5028 mils. No flats on either, plenty of grip on both for the riding that I've done. And tyre pressure is a whole new game I have to get used to. Up in Bright, running tyre pressures uphill was very different to what pressure I needed to be running downhill at a lot higher speed. I was having a horrible day descending off Mount Porpunka until I dropped about 10 psi out of back and front and just floated home. Definitely an area that I'm learning a lot on. Now let's talk about the most intimate part of a bike and that is the saddle. I did swap out the Pro Stealth, which I thought I was going to swap out all along. And I got the Pro Logo saddle, which is the kind of saddle they sell with the bike. Now I didn't get this because the Sparrow comes with the Pro Logo. It was just what was available online and was nice and light. I'm not sure I'll stick with it. It's been fine so far, maybe a bit too squishy. It's very similar to that of a Specialized Power saddle or a Kdex Boost, but it is a little more padded. Should be good for off-road, but I'm not quite sure yet. I'm always searching for that next saddle or the perfect saddle to fit me. I'm kind of on the fence with this one. The bars, they have just enough flair on them to be comfortable in the drops and the levers aren't twisted inwards as you see on a few gravel bikes. So it feels like a road setup no matter which wheel set that I'm running. So I'm happy with the bars. As is the case with any new bike build, there are a few components that need bedding in and readjustment after the first few rides. The number one thing I found on this was the crank preload need to be adjusted after a few hard sprints and the rear derailleur just needed a slight tweak. The only other maintenance task I've done on this bike requiring a torque wrench was to remove the headset, clean it and reseat it. After a few of those steeper descents in bright where I was on the anchors a lot, the headset had a bit of a creak to it. So out came the bearings, re-greased everything, put everything back together, smooth sailing again. The one component on the bike that's required most of my attention is the chain. And that's because I'm using the Silka Super Secret Chain Lube Drip Wax which is, I guess you'd call it a necessary evil for off-road. It keeps the dirt and the grime out of the chain and the components, so everything's nice and clean, but it just doesn't last very long whatsoever. I'm having to re the chain probably every three rides. Silka do claim that the super secret drip wax will quieten your drivetrain down a lot. It does for the first two kilometers. After 30 or 40 kilometers, it's back to making its normal drivetrain noises again. So I don't believe the hype when it comes to the quiet drivetrain claims, but the cleanliness and the performance has been quite good. So how does my custom spec Cervelo Espero stack up against the other gravel bikes I've ridden over the years? Well, I'll be honest, it's been a while since I've ridden the Giant Revolt and also the Canyon Grail. They are both a distant memory now. If I recall correctly, they were a good ride, but if I was on them for any longer periods of time, I'd want to tweak a few things here and there. A more interesting comparison is one I've done in recent times, and that is comparing this Cervelo Espero up against another Cervelo Espero with the same frame size with a different group set. Now my wife Vaughn has had an Espero online that has the Shimano GRX mechanical on it and it's a two by. This bike comes in at a very respectable 8.42 kilos on the scales. Out on the road, this what I would call budget Cervelo Espero handled very much the same as we'd expect. Although there was a lot more work to be done with the gears given it's mechanical and it had that extra chain ring on the front. If you're looking at buying an Aspero on a budget and don't want an electronic group set, this would probably be the way to go, knowing that you can upgrade the frame to an electronic group set at a later date. And there's not really much else to say about the bike other than I purchased it to ride, which I have been doing, as opposed to purchasing it or borrowing it just for the review. So I may be a little biased that I actually like the components that I've chosen. Okay, I'm going to finish today with a discussion of gravel bikes that I see posted online and I'll add my two cents too. And the statement that comes out quite often is that gravel bikes are all marketing. Just use a road bike with the right tires. I can agree with this statement only if you are planning on riding what I would call premium gravel. I definitely wouldn't be riding my road bike on washboard roads that rattle your teeth. A great resource to further demonstrate what I mean by premium gravel versus teeth rattling is over here on Cycling Tips. Now they have a video and a web page that defines types of gravel surfaces. We scroll down on here, you'll see here, that's what I would call premium surface gravel. Road bikes, not a problem whatsoever. And this surface here, which I would call slain, why did you take us down this descent in bright? They're the two extremes. If we roll down, they give them a gradient of, I think, grade here. One, two, see, road bike's okay for there. Three, you're not talking road bike anymore. You're gonna be slashing sidewalls on sharp rocks. Four and five, you're in borderline MTB terrain. 
Now all of those surfaces you can run a gravel bike on, but all of those surfaces you wouldn't run a road bike on. It just doesn't make sense. It would be a better argument to say you don't need a gravel bike, you need a cross country mountain bike, but then when you reverse the other way and go to the more smooth surfaces, you're on a heavier and slower bike. For me, it makes sense to have a specific gravel bike. You've seen throughout this video, the surfaces that I ride on, they're quite varied, and there's no way I'll be throwing my good road bikes that I test power meters and things on over some of those surfaces. So my take on this custom build Cervelo Espero is that I'm very, very happy. And if you're following me on Strava, this is not news. It's pretty much all I've been posting rides and photos from. Now Cervelo have bought out the Cervelo Espero version five just the other day. And I've told Von I won't be upgrading to that just yet. Okay, with that, thanks for watching this one. As always, give it a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the viewing and remember to hit subscribe to support this channel. We'll see you soon.